Welcome everybody. It's great to be here again. Some of you may remember I did the Country Fund Honor about three weeks ago and that was absolutely brilliant. So this week we've got teachers past and present. I worked at the primary school until last year. The other teachers are all currently working there and we have, let me just make sure this is uh, Mrs. Westova, who's our year one teacher, she's going to read the first story for you. Then we have Mrs. Bartley, who teaches year two and three. We have Miss Kay, um, who is the current year five teacher, and Mrs. Adewoli, who's the year six teacher. And I'm going to finish off with the final story and some, some thank yous and so on at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Mrs. Westover, who is going to read the first story to you. Over to you, Nina. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be with you today and read to you from one of my favorite books, My Friend Jesus by Etta B. Degering. And the story that I have chosen to read for you today is called Jesus and the Storm. Okay, are you ready to listen? Well done. Jesus stood in a boat, a fishing boat with oars and a sail, and talked to the many people who had come to hear him. All day long, Jesus told them stories. When it was evening, Jesus said to his helpers, let us cross over to the other side of the lake and rest. And this is what they did. Jesus' helpers untied the boat, they pushed it from the shore and raised the sail. Can you see the big white sail? One man sat in the back of the boat to guide it with the steering tiller. The steering tiller is like the wheel on the car, which helps it move in different directions. The boat moved slowly at first and then faster across the quiet blue sea. A round yellow moon came up over the lake. The stars twinkled high overhead. Can you see the twinkling stars in the sky? Jesus was so very tired, he lay down with his head on a pillow and was soon sound asleep. The man at the back steered carefully. The boat sailed on and on and on. Suddenly, a fierce wind began to blow. It blew a black cloud over the moon. It blew black clouds over the stars. It whipped the water into huge, angry waves. Can you see the huge, angry waves on the picture? The waves tossed the boat this way and that way and up and down. There was lightning. There was thunder. It was scary. The man at the tiller tried to steer the boat, but he couldn't. Other men tried to row the boat with oars, but they couldn't. Water filled the boat. It began to sink. The men were afraid. They walked Jesus. Lord, save us. We perish, they cried. Jesus heard their cry for help. He felt the angry wind. He saw the lightning flash. He heard the noisy thunder. But he was not afraid. He stood up and said to the wind and the waves, Peace, be still. The wind stopped blowing. The waves were still. There are no waves on the sea on that picture. The clouds went away and the stars twinkled again. The boat sailed on the sparkling path 
that the moon made on the water and crossed to the other side of the lake. Can you see that on the picture? Why were you afraid? Jesus asked his helpers. Why were you afraid when I was with you? Jesus says to the boys and girls today, don't be afraid when the lightning flashes and the thunder crashes and the strong winds blow. I am with you always, says Jesus, in the dark and in the storm. I will never leave you. Don't be afraid. And this is the end of the story. But now it's quiz time. And I'm going to check how well did you listen? And I have some questions for you. And Nina, just a question before we go to the quiz time. Um, uh, people are asking, what a book is this? What is the name of this book? All right. So it is my Jesus. friend Jesus. Lovely Everybody book. Was asking. Yes. Excellent. Nina. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. All right. It's a lovely book. And the first question, the first question is, what was Jesus doing in the boat in the beginning of our story? What was he doing? All right. So the question is there for everybody. Um, please do use the chat room and also comment section and write it down um, uh, there as well as also you can do it uh, on your worksheet. Okay. All right. So the answers started flying in and uh, other adventurers, amazing adventurers are saying um, uh, that Jesus was sleeping. Jesus was sleeping in the beginning of the story. Hmm. Think again. Jesus. Okay. Okay, and uh, people are saying that he was preaching. Yes, that's the correct answer. Excellent. Jesus was preaching all day. He was he talked he was talking to the people. Good job, everyone. Question number two. Where did Jesus and his friends go in the evening? Where did right. they go at the end of the day? What did Jesus say to the disciples, to his friends? All right. The question is there. Okay, so people are saying uh, at the sea, in a boat, at the lake. Uh, so this is what they're saying. That is all correct. They went across the lake on a boat. Good job, everyone. Good listening. Next question. What happened in the sea that night? Hmm, something. All right. Let's see what other adventurers will say on that. All right, people love writing down the answers and um, people are saying, well, there were lightings, there was a storm uh, and, and well, yeah, so it seems to me everybody was on the same page. They say the storm came. And they are absolutely right. Well done, everyone. There was a storm. Next question, question number four. How did Jesus' friends feel? All right, once How again. A very good question, and uh, the, the answer is anonymous this time, and they are saying they are scared or, or frightened. Absolutely right. They were afraid. They were scared, and not only afraid. I like the words that you guys used. Well done. And when there is storm, it's normal to be afraid, isn't it? If you yeah. are in the storm. What happened at the end of the story then? All right, uh, adventurers, let's see. Let's see what your answers are. Mm -hmm. The answers are not coming in. Oh, oh yeah, because they're writing, it's, like, it's a few more words. Uh, uh, so uh, the, uh, the, our adventurers are saying that Jesus calmed the storm. Well done. Jesus did calm the storm. And this is a very important lesson for us to learn, isn't it? And our last question. Question number six is why, 
we shouldn't be afraid. All right, the last question. Six, why we should be afraid? Why shouldn't we be afraid? There are so scary things. All right, so, so some beautiful, things. some beautiful answers started coming and somebody says, um, because Jesus loves us, uh, uh, we should not be afraid because God is with us. Uh, if somebody said we have Jesus, because, um, um, uh, because uh, uh, well, now dancers are, are becoming uh, uh, similar to one another, but bottom line they're saying it's uh, God is with us, we have Jesus, and he is all powerful. That is correct. And he has, and he said, don't be afraid because I am with you. And this is the correct answer. And this is what I want you to take from this story. Do not be afraid. Whenever you get afraid, remember that Jesus is with you and ask him to come into your heart when you're afraid. And he is going to come with his peace and you are going to be fine. Thank you so much for listening and answering the questions. All right, um, now Angelica, if you can introduce us the second uh, reader for uh, the next section. Right, so the next reader is Mrs. Bartley. I'm just trying to get my, um, and she teaches our year two and three classes. So over to you, Jill, please. Make sure you're unmuted, Jill. Yes, uh, we maybe your microphone is muted. I need to say as well that I just got this book for my kids um, on 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 Thursday. Oh, it's a lovely book. Okay, Jill, you're unmuted. Thank you. Okay, Wendy's Big Worry Not by Anne Hillmore. At the beginning of Wendy's Big Worry Not, before we get to the story, there is a scripture that we all need to remember, especially following Nina's story. When I'm afraid, O oh Lord Almighty, I put my trust in you. Amen. And this story is all about putting your trust in Jesus. Wendy was excited it was her first camp, camp ever, and it was her first adventure without her mum and dad. It felt really good to be independent and very grown up. On the first day, the campers had to choose their activities for the next 10 days. This is when Wendy discovered she had a big problem. Hmm. All the activities were water activities. As a prerequisite, which is a very long word, means, well, look it up in a thesaurus, look it up in a dictionary. Anyone who joined them had to be a reasonably good swimmer. The only option left for her was to join the swimming group. But Wendy couldn't swim. She started to worry and had a big worry knot and it tightened in her tummy. When she looked at the list, she looked up and down and she realized that everyone who had chosen to join the swimming group could swim already. She was the only one who couldn't. Another knot tightened around the worry knot that was already there. Wendy tried to make the worry go away. She tried to forget about it, to shut it out of her mind. It wouldn't go away. It just grew bigger. And another knot attached itself onto the worry knot and gave her a sickening jolt as it pulled itself really tight. Wendy heard the screams, you're weird, you can't, you're weird, you can't swim. And the shouts got louder and louder. Everyone will think that you're weird because you can't swim, she thought in her head. The knot grew some more 
it now was huge. In her head, Wendy heard the children snickering. Ah, oh, he, 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 Wendy can't swim. The worry knot grew some more. It was enormous. What if I drown? Wendy worried. Mum and Dad would be very upset. She tried to push it away from her mind. She just couldn't. She had this picture in her head. The worry knot seemed to take all the space in her body and her brain now. The worry was driving her mad. When it was time for the first session, Wendy pretended to have a headache. Hmm. The instructor believed her and Wendy got out of swimming, but he didn't help. And the worry just grew and grew and grew. She saw how good the other swimmers were. She felt useless. The worry knot pulled in every direction. It made her tummy really ache and her heart escaped into her throat. By the second session, Wendy didn't have to pretend. The worry knot was so big, it was making her feel sick. As she watched the other swimmers do amazing things in the pool, she remembered a memory verse that she had learned a few weeks before Quietly, she repeated it to herself. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. She remembered how the campers had sung the verse in worship around the campfire the evening before. It was a beautiful tune. She hummed it in her head and it seemed to calm her. I trust you, Jesus, she prayed silently. Now help me deal with this big worry. Suddenly, one of the knots unraveled. The worry knot didn't feel so tight. Wendy was beginning to think like a problem solver. That's a really good thing to do. Everyone who could swim was a learner once, she reasoned with herself. They may have been just as anxious as I am about it, but they jumped into the water and learned to swim. Another knot unraveled. She looked at the swimmers playing water polo in the pool. I could have fun like that too, if I learned to swim. I could learn to dive. I could learn to sail. I could learn to row. I could do canoeing. I could snorkel and windsurf. There was so much she could enjoy if she could swim, and it would be worth it. Another knot unraveled. I'm going to learn to swim. You better believe it, Wendy Jane, she told herself as she walked up to her counsellor. She plucked up the courage to confide in her, to tell her about worries and fears, and how determined she was going to learn to swim. And another knot unraveled. The counsellor smiled and replied, hey, I've got a plan. What if we have a very early morning lesson? I'll give you lessons every morning and then you can practice when we have the swimming activity. You won't have to worry about people staring at you. Wendy's face lit up and she gave her counsellor a high five. You're on, she shouted triumphantly. Another knot unraveled. Very early the next morning, Wendy had her first lesson. She used swimming aids. They helped her to float and she was pleased none of the other campers were close by to see her with the armbands and floats. I'm wearing armbands now, but not for long, she promised herself. Wendy made amazing progress in every lesson and she practiced hard while the others played water games in the pool. And guess what? Another knot unraveled. By the end of the week, Wendy could do little swimming kicks. 
across the entire width of the pool on her front and back without the use of any swimming aids and without her feet touching the bottom of the pool. Not even once. Then Wendy realised the worry knot had disappeared completely. At last, Wendy could swim. She could keep practising until she was a strong, confident swimmer. It is true that Wendy had learned to swim, but she had also get, learned how to turn her worry into an opportunity. She had learned that the opportunity would lead her to a whole lot more chain of a lot more opportunities. It was exciting. She had learned she could find solutions for every challenge, and so can you. There would be hurdles to face in the future, she knew. She could handle them because she'd learned the secret to un unravelling the worry knot. So now we have quiz time and it's really good to learn, to unlearn the secret, to learn and unlearn the secret of the worry knot. Why was Wendy excited? All right, the first question is there and we would like to ask all of our adventurers to uh, slowly start typing in the chat room and also in the comment section of Facebook um, uh, the answer on the question, why was Wendy excited? Oh, here it is. The answers slowly uh, are coming in. You need to know there is about nine seconds delay between uh, the Zoom and the Facebook. And um, uh, uh, um, our adventure saying she was excited because she was going to her first camp. Well done. Excellent. It was her first camp away from mum and dad. What activity had all the campers chosen? Swimming, running, or skateboarding? All right. And the answer came quickly uh, on uh, for this question. We're just waiting for our Facebook audience as well to have a chance to write it. Uh, so uh, the answer is uh, swimming. Well done. Excellent. What caused Wendy to have a worry not? Okay question to um, all of our adventurers. All right, uh, uh, they are saying that she could not swim. That's right. She, she, she looked at the list, she found out that everyone else could swim and she started to have that worry not. You really want to just be like everybody else and you want to be the same as everyone else, especially on a camp. And she just wasn't, she just didn't have the ability to swim. Not yet anyway. What did Wendy pray silently? All right, uh, our adventurers, can you uh, please type in the answer on what did Wendy pray silently? Okay. To not be afraid. Mm -hmm. That is the answer that is coming from our adventurers here in a Zoom room. And a very similar answer on, well, uh, similar answer on Facebook. Fantastic, of course. Now help me deal with this big worry. Let me trust in Jesus. Why was Wendy excited by the end of the story? Okay. And answers, answers started flying in and uh, they're saying that because she was able to swim. Mm. Well done everyone. She had learned to swim and she'd also learnt, found the secret of the worry knot and that was to trust in God. And to have a go and to to take challenges straight on and say, yes, I'm going to have a go, even though I can't do this challenge yet, I'm still going to give it a go. And well done to you, everyone who just takes on challenges. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. Uh, it, it is time for the next reading. And 
would you be able to introduce the reader first? So our next reader is Miss Kay. Um, Hi everyone. Right, lovely, you're unmuted already. So over to you, Gloria, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm <laughs> Miss Kay and I'm so excited to be with you all. I will be reading this book, which is called Looking After God's World. Uh, the topic is nature. I hope you enjoy it. Daddy picked up Tim's blue bucket and filled it right up to the top with sand that was just a little bit wet. He patted the sand with the flat part of the yellow spade until the sand was hard and smooth. Then he held his hand over the sand in the bucket and carefully turned it upside down onto the beach. He tapped the bucket gently and then lifted it up slowly and carefully. A perfect little sandcastle sat on the beach. Susie found some seashells and Daddy used them to make windows and doors for the tiny castle. Tim tried to make a sandcastle. He filled his bucket with sand and quickly turned it upside down, but all he made was a mess. He watched Daddy make another castle with Susie's bucket. Tim filled his bucket with sand again, pressed it down hard with his hands and his spade, and Daddy turned it upside down for him. This time, the castle looked almost perfect. Susie put some shells on the castle to make some windows, but she pressed too hard and the castle fell down again. Never mind, said Daddy, I've got an idea. Let's build a really big castle. Fill up your bucket with sand and empty them inside a circle and we will make the best sand castle ever. Susie and Tim filled their buckets with sand as quickly as they could and emptied them inside the big circle that Daddy had drawn on the beach. Daddy patted the sand with his hands until it was hard. The castle grew higher and higher. It was hard work, but it was fun. Then Daddy made some tall towers for the top of the castle. Mommy collected seashells and helped them to decorate the walls. Tim pressed a piece of smooth wood onto the front of the castle to make a door. They dug a ditch all around the castle. Daddy called it a moat and said it was, the, the, uh, it was to stop bad people getting inside. They tried to fill it with water from the sea but the water disappeared into the sand. So they filled the moat with wet green seaweed and pretended it was water. It was hard work digging and building, but when they had finished, they all agreed it was the best sand castle they had ever seen. At lunchtime, they ran into the edge of the cold sea and washed their hands. They ate their sandwiches, crisps, car uh, carrot sticks, fruitcake, and apples. Seagulls came to watch them eat. They seemed to scream for food, so Tim threw them some crumbs. When they'd, when they'd finished eating, Daddy collected up all the rubbish and put it into an old plastic bag. An empty crisp packet blew away along the beach and Daddy ran after it. He didn't want to spoil the beach with even the tiniest bit of litter. After lunch, Mommy read her book and Daddy, Susie and Tim walked along the beach to the little ice cream shop by the harbour. Next to the harbour stood a row of big bins on wheels for all the rubbish from the boats. So Daddy took the, the bag of lunch litter with him. After Daddy had thrown their rubbish safely into one of the bins, they went to buy their ice creams. Tim chose chocolate ice cream. Susie wanted strawberry ripple and daddy bought a newspaper to read. They sat on the bench eating their ice, uh, their ice creams and watching sailing boats and seagulls. Then they walked back to their castle paddling in the white lacy waves along the edge of the sea. Suddenly Tim started to run. Oh no, he said. Daddy looked up and saw that their castle had been squashed. The highest tower had fallen into the moat, the walls had been flattened, and shells and seaweed were all mixed up in the sand. Susie began to cry. 
A man came over to them and said, Is this your castle? Tim nodded sadly. I'm so sorry, said the man. My dog, Bobby, was running along the beach after his bow, and he didn't look where he was going. So he ran right through your lovely castle. I couldn't stop him in time. It's okay, said Daddy. We'll make a new one. Well, I've got a big bucket here, said the man. I'll help to get you started. You know, it's been a long time since I made a sand castle. I'm a builder, so we should have a brand new castle in no time at all. He was right. Soon the castle was bigger and better than ever before, with new towers and strong walls. Mommy helped them to find more shells to decorate the walls. Daddy took a picture of Susie and Tim next to their amazing sand castle, and soon it was time to go back to their holiday caravan. At bedtime, they read the story of creation because it was Susie's favorite. She loved hearing about all the animals God made. Then they went through the alphabet, thinking of lots of lovely things that God had made. Air, beaches, cats, chocolate. By the time they reached S, there were so many things on their list. They added Susie, sand, seagulls. When they reached the end of the alphabet, Tim said, hey, I know what we missed out, ice cream. And they all laughed. That night, the wind blew loud and strong. Things bumped and crashed in the night and the caravan shook, but they were all safe inside. In the morning, mommy packed another picnic and they drove to the beach as soon as they were ready. Susie ran onto the beach. Then she stopped and said, what happened to our lovely beach? It looks horrible. Oh dear, said daddy, who was just behind her. I think the storm must have blown over one of the big bins by the harbor. Bits of newspaper, plastic bags, empty bottles, only wrappers, tin cans, and broken spades were all over the sand. Tim said, let's go to a nice beach. I don't want to play here. But mommy had a different idea. I know. Why don't we help to make this beach better again? Someone needs to pick everything up and make it clean. If all of this washes out the sea, it will spoil other beaches and may and maybe and maybe hurt the, the fish too. You're right, said Daddy. We've got a row of bin bags in the car and we could fill them with all the rubbish right here. Someone needs to do the job and it might as well be us. Our rubbish from yesterday is probably blowing around too. When God made the world, he gave people the job of taking care of everything. So when we find a mess, it's important for us to help clean it up. It's our way of saying thank you to God for all the amazing things he's made. Remember yesterday when we built a lovely castle and we were so sad when Bobby crashed into it and broke it down? I think God must feel a bit like that when people do things that spoil his lovely world. It was kind of Bobby's owner to come and help us fix the castle again. That made us feel good, didn't it? I think God would be really happy to see us clean up this mess. Susie and Tim didn't think picking up rubbish would be fun. They thought they would much rather build a sand castle. So mommy said, let's have a race. Susie can help me and Tim can help daddy and we'll see who can fill the most bags in half an hour. Then we'll go down to the little shop and the winning team can have a chocolate flake in their ice cream. Mommy told the, ch the children to be careful when they picked up uh, what they picked up so they wouldn't hurt themselves. She found thick plastic bags, wrapped them around their hands and tied the handles around their wrists. They could still pick things up, but it would be safer for their hands. Mommy and Daddy picked up everything sharp or dirty. They soon filled their bags. There were lots of plastic bottles and newspapers. Susie found a bucket with a broken handle that, that would help them make a new sandcastle, and Tim found a flag to go on the top. Another family came down to the beach and asked if they could help too. It wasn't long before the beach looked even better than before. Soon there was no litter to be found 
anywhere. Some men helped daddy to turn the big bin by the harbor the right way up again, and they filled it up, and they filled, uh, filled it with all their rubbish bags. When they went into the ice cream shop, the lady said, thank you for tidying up. That was so kind of you. When I saw the mess, I thought no one would want to come today and I wouldn't be able to sell many ice creams. But you've all done a lovely job. I want you to have a free ice cream. You can choose anything you like. You can even have three scoops and a chocolate flake if you want to. They sat down by the harbor to eat their huge ice creams. Each of them had a chocolate flake in their cone. Tim ate his chocolate flake first, and Susie pushed hers right down inside the ice cream to save it till last. They looked at all the children playing on the beautiful beach. Then Tim said, I'm glad we tidied everything up. It was more fun than I thought it would be. Everything looks so much nicer now. I'm sure God was happy we helped too. I'm sure he was, said Daddy, standing up. Now, who is ready to build the biggest sandcastle in the whole wide world? This is the end of the story. It's a lovely story which teaches us many things. Now, I have prepared some questions for you. The first question is, when God made the world, what job did he give to people? What do you think? All right, adventurers, it's time to answer. So, um, the question is there for you on the screen, and answers already started flying in. Uh, so, uh, uh, I would say that I would say the eighty percent of our adventurers would be on the same um, page, and that is to take care of the world. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Amazing. Well done, Don Little. Yep, yeah. uh, I can see your answers um definitely to take care of our world um and preserve our environment keep it clean so all of these answers are correct definitely um we can read it in the bible and in this book as well god loves when loves it when we help and clean our environment definitely the second question is why is it important to take care of our planet why do you think it's important to take care uh, to keep everything clean. Why? Oh, somebody answered the very straight answer. So it doesn't look gross. I think that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a very much uh, 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 direct adventure answer. Um, uh, to, look, to look after it, to look clean. Uh, 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 our adventure is saying that uh, this is the best way uh, to keep our a planet tidy yeah. and, and quite a few <laughs> different answers and pollution i saw an answer um mentioning pollution yes definitely so we'll have less pollution less animals will die um and we'll have more resources so better air uh, more trees um our nature will be cleaner definitely it's all correct and also next question also, yeah. just before we go to the next question, uh, somebody on Facebook wrote to thank God for giving us this world. So it's beautiful. Yes, definitely. Thank God. Um, the next question is, just like in the story, how can we inspire others to take care of our planet? So in the story, we read about how um, the family cleaned the, uh, the beach and then another family came to help. So how can we inspire others? What do you think? Okay, maybe you can see some of the answers, but somebody says, well, we can inspire the others by being nice to them. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, we said that we shouldn't, uh, oh, the, a lot of answers are coming, applying here, about, by cleaning up some of the mess of ourselves. Uh, <laughs> uh, somebody even said to make a nature video. I love that answer, well done. <laughs> Um, Amazing. <laughs> uh, oh, somebody says we should protest, uh, but um, <laughs> a reality is that a protest can inspire some, but I think it probably comes with a personal example. To Oh, well, yes, yeah, so to pick up our litter, to teach them uh, about God's creation, uh, it's a lot of beautiful answers there. 
Excellent, exactly. I have the same answer to educate others, to talk more about recycling, reusing materials, and volunteer, and maybe, you know what, you can plant a tree even, because that, is, that still helps our nature and our environment. So definitely excellent answers, well done. Somebody on the Facebook also wrote uh, to keep our home and around our home clean. By telling that the God, uh, by telling yeah. that the, uh, that God gave us this world as well. So I think everybody got it right. Excellent. Yes, definitely. The last question is: Why is God happy when we look after the world He created for us? So why do you think God is so happy when we keep everything tidy and clean, and His the world He created for us clean? Why? Oh, the answers started coming in very quickly. We just need to give chance to those guys on Facebook as well because they're a little bit behind <laughs> the live stream. But uh, uh, the answers can be read in the chat room because it looks nice, um, because he blessed the world. Um, and he, uh, uh, wow, quite a, quite a few answers. They're coming quickly, so it's very hard for me to read. Um, Oh, because we are treating it, it is our home, because mm -hmm. it's his gift to us. Um, yep. Quite a few different answers. Amazing, yes, exactly. It's his gift for us. And just like in the story, um, God has built a beautiful sandcastle for us, which is our world. And we need to take care of it and keep it beautiful, because um, it's, you know, it's very, very pure. Like one of you said, it's it's pure and it's beautiful and we need to be responsible caretakers, definitely. I'm <laughs> astonished by your amazing answers. Yeah, oh, and, and someone on Facebook says, because it means we appreciated what he gave yeah. us. Exactly, oh. excellent answer. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to the amazing Mrs. Adewoli. <laughs> All right, Good. we are ready for the next uh, story. Yep, just make sure that you're unmuted, please. That's correct. Uh, we, uh, we mute the microphones just because we are recording it and for the quality sound later on, or sound late for later on. I'll, I'll unmute you, Nikki. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yes, hello, everyone. Good to see you. I'm going to be reading you a story from the guide's greatest mission stories now the title of the story is the jonah who swallowed a fish now this story doesn't have a lot of pictures so please listen carefully it's a story by raymond wolsey his name is not really jonah but i believe you will agree that he could be called that his real name is something more like manuel and he lives in the Philippines. Look at a map, you can see the map on the screen, the map of the Philippines, and you will see that the largest island, the one with Manila on it, is called Luzon. If your map shows a lot of detail, you will find a province south of Manila called Batangas. I hope you can see that. That is where Manuel lived as a fisherman. He owned his own banker, which is a dug out canoe with a hole so slim it could cut through the water like a knife. Manuel's brother had made the banker, sharpening the hole and hollowing out the inside with hand tools. Two beams across the banker, fore and aft, held the outriggers. Outriggers are run parallel on long lengths of bamboo on each side of the hall. They keep the banker from turning over and capsizing in the sea. Seen from an airplane, bankers with their outriggers look like water striders. Although Manuel rode in his banker alone, he usually fished in a group with other fishermen. Nearly all the men in his barrio, that's his village, were fishermen. They worked at their job both day and night. 
At night, each man would light a kerosene treasure lantern and hang it from a pole over the side of his banker. The fish, attracted by the bright light, would rise to the surface and the men would catch them in small nets. In the daytime, some men would work together with long nets pulled between two bankers, but Manuel's daytime fishing was usually done was usually done near his backlad. He had made this backlad by tying bamboo poles into a long bundle, 50 or 60 feet long. He had towed this out to where the sea was 40 or 50 feet deep. He had tied large stones to one end of the bamboo bundle so that the end would sink. The other end floated upright. A bundle of bamboo like this attracts algae and small sea lice such as shrimp. Small fish come to feed on the algae and shrimp and these small fish attract bigger fish, some three or four feet long. These were the fish Manuel liked to catch. Manuel would come out here in his banker with a fishing pole and line to hook the big fish. They always brought a fine price in the market. If his hook got caught in the bamboo, he would just cut it off rather than go into the water after it. Sharks like to hang around these bamboo bundles. That's a bit scary, isn't it? It was not worth risking his life with a shark just to save a fish hook. One Sabbath morning, the man who was in charge of all the corporators in the mission, Pastor Lamera, visited the little church where Manuel worshipped. It was always a treat to have a visiting speaker, and everyone listened closely to Pastor Lamera's message, especially to the interesting corporator, especially to the interesting corporator stories he told. Pastor Lamera was recruiting new caporters and he reminded the fishermen that Jesus had given the invitation, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Manuel loved the Lord and he wanted to help hasten the second coming, but he wasn't sure about becoming a culpator. A culpator is a literature evangelist. I'm just a fisherman, he explained to Pastor Lamera. I don't know how to sell books or how to do anything but fish. Perhaps someone else had better do this book work and I would just fish and pay my tithe. Don't worry, Manuel, encouraged Pastor Lamera. All you need is training and we will provide you with that. In fact, just two weeks from now, we will conduct a Corpeter Institute in Lucena City. There, will, there we will give special instruction to beginners such as you. You be there and we will teach you what you need to know. I am sure the Lord will bless you in your efforts to serve him. Manuel agreed and in his heart, he really was happy at the prospect of being in active service for the Lord. In the meantime, however, there was fishing to do. There never was much money in the house and he could not afford to be idle while he waited to get into the work of selling gospel books. As the days went by, Manuel did some more thinking about selling books. It would mean going from town to town. It would mean going into the shops and homes of people he had never seen before. Some of them might be rich people. Many of them could be educated. Who was he, a fisherman, to be going to such places? Perhaps the place for him was in his banker. After all, fishing for fish. The day came when the Colpeter Institute was to open in Lucena City. Manuel moved slowly that day. 
and when he did move, it wasn't in the direction of Lucena. Manuel, aren't you going to Lucena today? His mother called when she heard him still pottering around underneath the house. I guess I'm too busy today, he replied, and he threw his rod and fishing tackle into his banker. With a good hard shove, he had the boat off its blocks and into the water. He jumped aboard and was soon out over the waves on his way to his back lad and that bundle of bamboo floating out there in the sea. On his way, Manuel could see starfish on the sea, on the sea bottom through the clear blue-green water. Coral and shells of various kinds were there too, but they held no interest for him today. Not only were they common, but his conscience was battling him. Fishing was good as usual. There were not so many large fish today, but there were plenty of smaller ones. Other fishermen were working nearby, and occasionally they called back and forth to one another over the water. One fish that Manuel caught was particularly active. It was large, but with its flipping and flopping, it might soon jump out of the boat back into the water. Following a custom among the fishermen, Manuel picked up the fish and raised it to his mouth. A bite into its backbone would paralyze it, but the fish was slippery. With a quick convulsion, that fish slipped out of Manuel's hand, right down his throat. Imagine that, the scales on the fish prevented Manuel from pulling it out, and it was too big to go down. The fish was stuck in Manuel's throat, and it was strangling him, choking the life out of him. Fortunately, Manuel's contortions and jumping around in his banker caught the attention of another fisherman who quickly paddled over to see what was the matter. The other man could not get the fish out either, but he rowed Manuel in his banker back to the village. By the time they got there, Manuel was unconscious. Friends carried him to the hospital. There, the doctor, with much effort, was finally able to get the fish out of Manuel's throat. Thank God for that. In a week or two, Pastor Lemura returned to Manuel's barrio to see what had happened to this young man who had promised to become a culpator. Why hadn't he shown up at the training institute? Pastor Lemura was hardly prepared for what he saw. For Manuel was thin and gaunt and haggard. I nearly died, Manuel explained as he told the story of his running away and of how he nearly swallowed that fish. But I have learned my lesson, he said. I have learned not to go back on my promise or run away from God. As soon as I get back my strength, I will join the Lord's work. Manuel kept his promise this time and soon was engaged in the literature ministry. And it wasn't many months before Manuel was one of the star culpators in the entire mission. And that is the end of the story. And now it is quiz time. So the first question, what four things can you remember about who Manuel is? Our chat room in the comment section is always open for you to write it down, your answers. So uh, it is time for us to use our fingers for typing. Uh, okay, the first answer came through. He was a fisherman. All right. Uh, then we have... Um, well, everybody remembers that he was a fisherman for sure. Now the question is, what is the second? Okay, that he's from Philippines. Some people are saying, it, and then uh, he did not 
uh, uh, he, he ran away from the, the, the course. So at the moment, uh, th that is what came through. Okay. Okay. But, well, one thing is that his real name is not really Jonah. <laughs> he did live in the Philippines. Some people have said that. He owned his own banker. And yes. he was a fisherman. Yes. So we got about, uh, not all of them, but almost all of them. Yes. <laughs> That's lovely, lovely answers. Second question. Who is Pastor Lamar and how does he influence the direction that Manuel's life takes? Okay, let's see. Uh, we are now waiting for the answers. And uh, well, I just wanna ask everybody who is uh, watching this, please just write one answer. Don't write the same answer three or four times uh, because it's hard to follow. Uh, so um, let's try to answer question two. Uh, he was asked. Uh, he was. He was asking him actually to be co-porter to sell the books. Uh, the pastor preached in in uh, Manuel's church. Uh, so these these are the answers that came through. Oh, he was also asked and encouraged to be evangelist uh, in in this way. So these are the answers we have. Well, those are lovely answers. Because yes, Pastor Lemire was a pastor. He was a pastor in charge of missions. And he invited Manuel to train to become a culprita. And the reason I asked you that question is because do you know that there are people around you, like Pastor Lamura, who see God's treasure in you and they're sowing the seeds for you to follow God's calling in your life? Thank you. So, our third question What challenge and circumstance did Manuel face before he decided? To become a literature evangelist. All right. Now, uh, then our adventurers, I'm sure they will give us the right answers, and uh, uh, we're going to wait just for a little while for everybody to start typing. Well, somebody said he had a fish stuck in his throat. <laughs> that was beef. that was a uh, uh, that was after he was challenged to do this. Uh, uh, but what what other challenges circumstances did the many of faced before he decided to become a literature evangelist? Okay, uh, you are all answering the uh, after uh, after. But what was before that? He didn't have any. <laughs> yeah he actually had many challenges in his life didn't he that he had to make sure that he fished enough to get enough money but then he had the accident and the key thing about the accident is that this whole story is a story about obedience that when God does call us that we can be obedient to the calling of God and not be a Jonah thank you Thank you very much for that. Um, do we have any more questions or? Uh, or I think those are the three questions. Those yes. are three questions. So Angelica, um, uh, it is your time now. Right, thank you, Diane. And um, my story is all about keeping healthy. Now, the book I'm about to read to you is also written by Anne Pilmer. You remember one of the earlier books was by the same author. And what I can tell you is that Anne Pilmer was actually a teacher and head teacher at Danborough Primary School a number of years ago. When my daughter was in the school, she was the head teacher um, at that time. And she later also became the education director for the British Union Conference. And now she started to write books. I love this story, and I've actually bought a copy of it for myself. Jack and Jill were twins. But their birthdays were not on the same day. Jack was born at three minutes to midnight on the 21st of October, and Julia arrived six minutes later at three minutes past midnight on the 22nd of October. How amazing is that? Jack and Julia were very close. They did everything together. They played together. They shared the same friends. 
they like the same things and they dislike the same things too. Turn the page and join them on their journey. It started with a blob of cabbage. I wonder how many of you like cabbage. I know I didn't when I was a child. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Jack and Julia hated school dinners. They didn't like vegetables of any kind. They especially hated onions. And most of all, they hated cabbage. The only food they enjoyed at school was pizza. And it was hardly ever on the menu. They begged their parents to give them packed lunches. Cooked dinners and healthy vegetables are better for you, their parents replied. Jack and Julia's parents did not know they hardly ever ate dinners, especially after Julia had come up with a cunning plan. This is how it worked. Julia would talk to the teacher and distract her so Jack could either shove his food into a napkin and dash to the toilet to flush it away or scrape it into the bin. Sometimes he'd pick it up and drop it on the floor near to someone else. Then he would talk to the teacher and distract her so Julia could get rid of her vegetables quickly. They were very happy that their plan was working well. And then, that Wednesday, after weeks of veg and no pizzas, it seemed as if everyone was fed up with boring school dinners. Yuck, not cabbage again, everyone in the dining room groaned. We hate cabbage, they all chanted. Just then, Julia stabbed her fork into the lump of cabbage on her plate, held it up and flipped it. It flew like a flying saucer and skidded across one of the tables before landing on Charlie's plate. And then all the copycats joined in. Within seconds, there was mayhem. Julia had started a cabbage storm. Mr. Osborne, the head teacher, rushed in to see what was going on. Quiet, he bellowed. The cabbage storm stopped. In absolute stared at the blanket of green moss and the green skid marks on the dining room floor. Everyone pretended to chew their food. They didn't dare look up at Mr. Osborne. How did this happen, Mr. Osborne asked. I've never seen you behave like this before. After a long pause, a quiet little girl with a bouncy ponytail squeaked, Julia started it, sir. Julia was going to be in trouble. She felt sick. Jack felt bad too. Surprisingly, Mr. Osborne did not call Julia into his office that day, nor the next, nor the following day. Perhaps Jack and Julia were not in trouble after all. And then, out of the blue, at the dinner table at home the next week, Julia made a fuss about cabbage and hating vegetables all over again. Mum's eyes grew wide and she cocked her head in a no-nonsense kind of way. Dad gently put down his knife and fork, folded his hands and calmly asked, So, Master Jack, so, Miss Julia, can you explain how you managed to turn all the students off their vegetables at school? Julia tried her silly giggle to make Dad laugh. It usually worked but not this time. She looked at Jack and innocently asked, have we ever told the other students not to eat their vegetables, Jack? Mum and Dad were silent as they waited for an answer. They would sit there all night if they had to. Jack and Julia knew this was not going to be easy. Finally, Julia blurted out, we're sick of school dinners. We're sick of having to eat disgusting cabbage. Please, can we have packed lunches? Truthfully answer your dad's question first, Mum replied. Again, there was a long, uncomfortable silence. Julia giggled nervously as she held her hand over her mouth. 
One of us has to be brave, thought Jack. I don't think we've put anyone off eating their vegetables. We just don't like vegetables and we'll do anything to get out of eating them. We like pizzas, but they hardly ever serve them, he said. Last week, everyone was annoyed because they served cabbage again and we started chanting loudly that we didn't like it. Julia accidentally flicked a lump of cabbage off her fork. It seemed funny and everyone started doing the same. She didn't tell them to do it. I promise, hand on heart, said Jack. Thank you, Jack, said Dad. Mum and I have had a long conversation with Mr. Osborne. You and Julia will have to apologise to him and the rest of the school for your poor table manners last week. We expect nothing less from you. That isn't the end of the story. You may think it's smart to pretend you've eaten your vegetables when you haven't. All you're doing is harming yourselves. How can you be healthy and strong when you're missing out on all the important vitamins, minerals and other nutrients we get from vegetables if you don't eat them? Mr. Osborne, Mum and I have agreed that you should do a project on health over the next few weeks. We'd like you to interview a doctor and some other people who can help you to understand how to look after your health. We bought a project book for you with pens, stickers, different decorations and glue. We want you to record everything you will learn from them. You have an appointment with Dr. Lee tomorrow. Oh, and to help you along, we've locked away your iPads and all your electronic gadgets. Jack and Julia were shocked. But then Julia popped up unexpectedly. Cool. I'm looking forward to this project. This is going to be fun. Now, as I said, this book is a little bit longer than just this first story. And if I just hold up the page, there are lots more stories. But one thing they learned when they went to see Dr. Lee is some of the ways that they can keep their bodies healthy. And those are to eat healthy food, to exercise regularly and have enough rest, to breathe in fresh air, get enough sunlight, drink plenty of water, and be cheerful. That is, live with a song that Jesus puts in our hearts. So, time to see how well you listened. Jack and Jill were twins. When is their birthday? Is it A on the same day because twins always share a birthday or is it B on different days? All right, uh, it's, a, it's a tough question there. Uh, so let's see how adventures do. Uh, our chat uh, is open and of course comment section. So uh, the adventurers are saying it is uh, option A. Oh. If you remember at the beginning of the story, it said they were born on different days because Jack was born at three minutes to midnight on the 21st of October and Jill was born at three minutes past midnight on the 22nd of October. Adventurers change their mind very quickly. Everybody's typing it's option B. <laughs> what did Jack and Jill not like to eat? All right, so. It's an open question for everybody. Oh, oh, everybody says writing it. They did not like to eat the vegetables, but it seems to me cabbage is winning on that list. Yeah, they didn't like vegetables, especially onions and cabbage. How did the cabbage storm start? The cabbage storm. Let's and please see. don't start a cabbage storm at your school. It is not possible. Uh, 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 let me just see. All right. There's, uh, Julia flicked cabbage. Yep. She stabbed her fork into the cabbage on her plate, held it up and flicked it, and it flew across the tables and landed on Charlie's plate. And of course, everybody joined in. Name some of the best ways to build healthy bodies. This was right from the end of the story. Some of the best ways to help us build healthy bodies. Okay, uh, answer started coming. Exercise, rest, 
drinking water, eating vegetables, uh, um, and many other things, but sunshine, so uh, very good answers. So healthy food, exercise regularly, rest, fresh air, sunlight, plenty of water, and the last one, of course, was be cheerful. Excellent. Um, now, you will see that um, we've been showing you on the slides at the end of each story some other books on that genre. And at this point, I just want to take an opportunity to say thank you to Trevor Johnson from the Stanbrook Press, because he actually donated four of the books that we've shared with you today, four of the stories that we shared with you today. Um, so a huge thank you for that. And those books are going to go into the Stanford Primary School Library for other children to read and enjoy and learn from. Um, and I'm just going to, have we got Trevor? Then? Yes, Trevor is here. He can unmute himself and say hello to everybody. Trevor, uh, just make sure you click unmute button and you should be able to. Are you there? I don't know what's happening. All right. Um, Trevor, if you're able to connect, yeah, it's no problem at all. Angelica, uh, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you to the teachers from Stanford Primary School who've been taking part in this. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your stories. Loved listening to them. And I, I hope that children, I hope that you've enjoyed the stories that we shared with you today. And you might go back to the PowerPoint when it goes up and actually look at some of the books and get maybe one or two of them for yourself or some of the other books we had suggested. Please keep reading. Absolutely. Trevor, are you able to say hello? Yes, I am. I was, uh, I was forced to be muted, but uh, now being unmuted, I'm, I'm glad that we're able to actually make a contribution towards the Pathfinders with reading. We're passionate about reading and I can tell you if you take the opportunity to read, as I'm sure has been mentioned throughout the course of the, the, the program today, you will enhance every aspect of your life and you'll go on to be extremely successful. What I'd like to say is that we have many, many books on our website and I'd like to encourage you all to come along and pay us a visit. Um, it's www.lifesourcebookshop.co.uk. Um, hopefully that information will be available at the end. Um, but come along and visit. There's a whole section on children's books. There's over 113 titles there, uh, and some of them you've seen. Uh, we pride ourselves on having some of the best children's books around, and they're all filled with principles and uh, values that your children can learn that you can take across uh, the Christian divide out into the world. So I, I think we're a good place to start with your reading. So uh, I encourage you to come and visit us at the shop as well if you happen to be in Hertfordshire. If you're not in Hertfordshire, use the online. But great to be able to partner with uh, Diane and your team to be able to support uh, Pathfinders. Trevor, thank you so much for everything and for the donation.